Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, tonight I want to introduce our study by using a passage out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, if you look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, it's a passage that you'll recognize, but I want to pick up on one of the themes in this passage. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What I want to pick up on there, of course, you'll recognize that passage contains the great commandment, which Jesus spoke of later on in the Gospels <clears throat> when asked, what is the, the most important commandment? And he said, the first is like, you know, like this. And then he quoted from this passage in Deuteronomy. So here is the, the great commandment. But I want to pick up on the fact that he says to write these things down, to be able to remember these things. So you write them on the frontlets of your heart. You write them every place you can write them, the doorposts of your house. You teach them diligently to your children. And that introduces the subject tonight of catechism. Now, in the old days, in the, the old church, back in the Reformed days, following the Reformation, there needed to be a way to come up with some mnemonic way so we could teach doctrine, but teach it in a way that it could be accepted, and which is what basically we're being told in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so <clears throat> I picked on Rich, Richard Baxter here. Uh, he had a catechism that he used uh, in his church and in, and in his life, and it was a short one. Now, he had, at the time that Richard Baxter was pastoring, uh, he had, of course, the Westminster Longer and Shorter Catechism, which is law and lots of things to remember. Well, he whittled that down to just uh, 10 things that he wanted to remember every day. Uh, and for, here's, for example, uh, what do you believe concerning God? Now, see, that question provokes something in your mind. You know, you, you need to provide an answer to that. What do I believe about God? His answer is, there's only one God and three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is infinite in being, power, wisdom, and goodness. He is the maker, preserver, and disposer of all things, and the most just and merciful Lord of all. So there's a way of remembering how Richard Baxter saw God, what he thought about God. Now, in uh, question number two, he says, how did God make man and what law did he give him? And his answer is, God made man for himself in his own image and gave him a righteous law requiring perfect obedience upon pain of death. Now, that's a simplified statement of the whole sweep of the history of mankind, isn't it? God created man in his own image, that's Genesis chapter 1, but man fell, that's Genesis chapter 3. And now because of it, we find ourselves in a pickle because we cannot perfectly obey God, and so pain of death is what has come upon all men. So all men have sinned and therefore deserving of death. Now, Richard Baxter wanted to remember that in a short way. So having a catechism allows you to state a lot of truth in a very small space, okay? Now, all that got me to thinking. Now, you know, you can read Richard Baxter's 10 things if you want to. Uh, he didn't give scriptural proof here. He just put these up in his mind so he could uh, use this. Now, if you use a catechism properly, what it can be used for is discipling yourself and other people. It can be used for evangelism because it can bring to mind some things you want to talk about the gospel, etc. And it can be used in your own life for personal holiness because the things wind up being treasures in your heart that remind you of what you need to do on a daily basis. When God says, you shall be holy for I am holy, well, how are you going to do that? You know, what, what's your plan of attack? And a catechism can give you that. So here's what I want to challenge tonight. If you notice on the second page of your handout, the Richard Baxter handout, I ask you this question. I, I said, have you ever thought about developing your own catechism? I mean, start with a single question, to the answer to which helps contribute to your holiness. Always tie its tenets to Scripture. In other words, if I'm going to have an element in my catechism, a question in my catechism that says, this is what I believe, then you need to tie that into Scripture. How do you get that out of Scripture? So 
I give you an example of one here that's in mine. And by the way, I did more, okay? So I want to share with you some of the more that I did just to show you how this can happen. Now, I know the first thing that crosses your mind is probably, that sounds like a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Well, suppose that lot of work could be condensed down so that it wasn't really as much work as you thought it was going to be, and it saved you a lot of time later on and a lot of grief. Because is there anything worse than having somebody ask you a question about the Bible that you don't know the answer to? I mean, talk about being on the spot. I mean, that puts you immediately, you know, reeling. And so instead of being able to give a forthright answer, you get on your, you know, back on your uh, heels and you're talking in the defensive and deflecting. Well, that's not a good way to do evangelism. So I, I ask a question here. Here's my question number one. Uh, for what reason did Christ give his life for me? Now, isn't that a reasonable question that you need to know the answer to? I mean, you're not going to give an answer like because I deserved it, because I was worthy of it, because he should have, because he created me and he needed to buy me back anyway. No, none of those answers satisfy what the Bible says. So here is my answer to that question. The question again was, for what reason did Christ give his life for me? And my answer is, because he loved me. His love provoked him to purchase me with his own blood in order to free me from the bondage and penalty of sin that I might glorify him in my body and to reconcile me to God. He thus gave his life in order to give me eternal life. Now that's my answer to that question. Uh, and so, uh, what the first thing I want to say to you is your questions ought to be your own, okay? And, and here's how to know which questions to ask. You ever had that nagging feeling that, you know, there's a question that you really wish you had a better answer to than the one you got? <laughs> so make a catechism and answer the questions, okay? Now, here is biblically how I tie my answer to the question. First of all, 1 John 4.10, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans 8, 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And then uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And finally, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And those scriptures form the basis of the answer that I give to the question, for what reason did Christ give his life for me? I mean, I could put answer upon answer out of scripture there, of course. But you want your, your uh, you know... Uh, catechism to come down to something that you can lay hold of now how could i use that for example on a daily basis well here's an idea suppose i took a three by five card or a four by six card in some cases i may need a four by six card and on one side i put the question and i put the answer and on the other side i put the scriptures so i'm not I'm, on one card i'm asking a question and I'm answering the question and then I'm telling why on the back. Now that's just one idea. Uh, you could do what I've done here too. You know, I just made up a sheet of eight and a half by 11 with my questions and answers on it because I thought to myself, you know, this is worthy of a follow on project here. You know, I need to ask and answer these questions for myself to keep my skills honed, to be a constant reminder of who I am in Christ and what he's done for me. And if I really say that I want to bring glory to God, maybe I ought to back up and think about what he said would bring him glory. You know, often we pray a prayer like, God, be glorified in me. Well, what we want is that that happens on our own terms. <laughs> you know, I want to do something great, you know, win the Olympics, you know, I mean, and then I go, yeah, glory to God, you know. 
But suppose God's way of getting glory is that you suffer persecution and you refuse to renounce his name, and in that he's glorified. So how does God get the glory through our lives? So that would be another question, for example. So I want to ask and answer as many questions as I can. And then what I want to do is I want to just review those. Now, this is all for me. I mean, you know, you. You know, this is not, you're not doing this for a, a class. You know, you're not doing this because you're going to show it to somebody. What you're doing this for is for personal discipleship, for your own personal holiness. And so you might develop this perhaps as a tool that you can use in evangelism. Uh, let me give you another one that I ask and answer. You guys up for this? Here is number two. What is to be my prevailing view of all my activities? In other words, as I go about my daily business, my daily routine, what, what view am I supposed to have as I go about doing those? Well, here's my answer. I am to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. I am to mortify, that is put to death, the deeds of the flesh. I will not regard sin in my heart, nor give it any place in my thinking. Truth will be my guide. So the question is, what's to be my prevailing view? Well, I'm going to say no to sin and yes to God. You know, I'm going to mortify the sin in my own life, and, and I'm going to look at that, and I'm not going to address that. I'm going to refuse to go down that road. Well, what scriptures might we give uh, as a, you know, a point of reference for this? Well, how about Romans 6, 12 and 12 through 14? For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Psalm 51, 5 and 6, the most poignant psalm in all the psalms because David's confessing sin here. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Psalm 34, 13 and 14. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, or Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 John 2, 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So you see where we're going here? So as I ask and answer the question, I ensure that I'm not just making up stuff, that I'm not just saying things that sound good, you know, that I'm not giving polite little answers to hard little questions, but rather I'm using the Word of God to expand and expound upon the answers which I am providing. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you want to hear one more? Let me give you one more. Now, again, this is just mine, okay? Question three. What should be my attitude about life which motivates my thoughts and actions? My first priority, this is the answer, my first priority is to do all that I do for the glory of God. I must remember that the greatest of all in the sight of God will be those who are servants like Christ was a servant. I must not seek the praise of men, but rather the approval of God. My life must be lived in holiness that it may be laid upon the altar of sacrifice to God as a spiritual service of worship. So here's the biblical basis for that answer. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Matthew 23, 11 and 12. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, 
and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Then there's that extensive passage in Philippians 2, which you can read for yourself, verses 3 through 11. Have this mind in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Okay. John 12, 43. Speaking of the Pharisees, Jesus says, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Matthew 23, 5 to 7. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Galatians 1.10 For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So you can either be a God pleaser or a man pleaser, but you can't be both. And of course, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the, the world, this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And finally, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to the completion in the fear of God. So you see the way this goes? Now, these are questions that I, here's the way I began. I asked myself, what would I like to remember on a daily basis? In other words, if there's a question in my mind that I want to find an answer to, be able to give an answer to, and live the answer to, what would that question be? And then what would the answer be to the question? And then, is there any spiritual validity to it? Okay. Now you say, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Okay, well then, you want to be spiritual? Let's do this. Study the Bible and let the questions erupt out of that. Okay. But I'm just saying to you, those of us who've been in church for a while and have studied the Bible for a lot of years, we know some things that we should be doing. The question is, are they biblical? Are they supported by Scripture? And so what we do is we test our question with the answer, and we test the answer with the Scripture so that we're not in error in any way. Now, I'm advocating that it might be a constructive exercise to try to do this. You know, think in your mind about questions that you need to know the answers to or that you should know the answers to. What kind of things will they be? Well, there'll be things that will be your own personal discipleship. There'll be things that, that you want to have before you because you might want to use them in evangelism. Tell somebody else the truth. Uh, we were at uh, Home Depot yesterday afternoon, and uh, one of our favorite people there is a cashier who's a Christian woman. And she's had, in some aspects, a rough start in her life. But she's always asking some question about, what can I tell somebody when they say this? Or when they act like this, how can I come back with them? I mean, every time I'm in there, every time we're in there together, it's the same kind of story. Well, wouldn't it be good if you had already kind of rehearsed in your mind that question? You know, what do you say to somebody? Uh, for example, three or four months ago I was in there, and... Uh, she asked me the question about what do you do when somebody says they just don't believe what you're telling them about Jesus Christ? Now listen, I've rehearsed the answer to that question scads of times in my own heart and mind. So here's what I said. Believing something doesn't make it true. Disbelieving something doesn't make it false. Truth always stands. So you have to ask yourself the question, would I know the truth that was, if it was standing right in front of me? Well, what does truth have the property of? It doesn't change, so it's eternal. It's always the truth, and each and every situation in which it applies, and you can count on it always to be there. So I would say to this man, if you want to know the truth, then ask yourself this question. What's going to happen to me when I die? You say, well, I don't know the answer to that question, but I don't think there's a hell, to which I would say, just because you don't believe there's hell, there's a hell, doesn't mean there isn't a hell. Suppose there was a hell. What would you do then? Or suppose you don't believe in heaven. Suppose there is one. What do you do then? The only way to cover that whole thing of disbelief and unbelief is to say this. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he came to cover our sins, that answers a problem you know you have. You know you're a sinner. 
Now, sometimes people will say, how do I know I'm a sinner? The fact that you asked me the question means that you know the answer because you know when you do wrong. God gave us a conscience. Everybody on the planet has one. You know it's wrong to steal. You know it's wrong to lie. You know it's wrong to run around on your wife. These things you know. Why is that embedded in your psyche? Why do you have that? Why didn't we evolve out of that if there's such a thing as evolution? And the answer is because we can't, because it stands in the truth. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is, is in Jesus Christ. He offers life in place of death. So attach yourself to things that are going to be eternally true and can be proven to be true if you just stop and think and apply yourself to understanding. She says, wow, where did you read that? I said, I didn't read that. I just told you that. You know, see, that, that's what a catechism can do for you. You see, it can help you in times like that to be able to answer questions for people. All right, I'm going to do something I don't usually do. Now, if you're on our live broadcast here, I'm going to ask for questions. And if anybody asks them, I'm going to try to repeat it so you'll know what they ask. And then we'll take a couple of these if anybody has them uh, and answer them. So does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about tonight, about how you do this, how you come up with the questions? Yes. What's the best way to find the supporting scriptures to go along with the answers to your questions? That's a very good question. What's the best way to find the supporting uh, scriptures that, are, that form the basis for your answers to your questions? Well, I would say it like this. If you don't know anything about the Bible whatsoever, then you start with simple questions <laughs> like, you know, who is God, you know? Well, you start back in the beginning with Genesis 1. In the beginning was God, etc. If you're, you've been in church for a long time, already you know the formative understanding of some things, but you, you know more than you think you do. So you develop your questions first. That's important. And from your questions, when you're seeking the answers, you say, how would I know that's an answer to that question? Then you start asking God to open your heart and your mind to his word. And what he, Jesus said to the disciples is true. It will be given to you to know what the answers are. Now, Barring that happening, you can always call your favorite pastor up and say, I've got this question and I think I've got the answer. You know, could you help me a little bit? Or a Sunday school teacher or somebody like that that could help you. You can always use the concordance in the back of your Bible. You know, that thing that's in the back of your Bible is, is more than a space taker. <laughs> you know, it's actually usable. It's got subjects organized there and scriptures that go along with them. And so you can find a lot of help right there. There are also topical Bibles, which take basically every topic up and provide scriptures for that topic. So you have resources that can help you like that. Good question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm always asked the question, why do you Baptists believe in one saved, always saved? And, and, and that's a question. Why do you Baptists believe that once you're saved, you're always saved? See, people ask that. And, and by the way, isn't that a good question to put in your catechism? How do I know that once I'm saved, I'm always saved? You know, we've got a two-word designator for that. We call it eternal security. Uh, we say that once you come to Jesus Christ, uh, that, uh, you know, he grabs a hold of you, and even though you may let go of him, he's not going to let go of you. Uh, and so how do we know that? How can we say that? Well, first of all, the answer is because it's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Now, unless God's a renigger, you know, he takes back his gifts or one of those re-gifters, you know, which we hear so much about today at Christmas time. God's not taking the gift back. It's a gift. So Romans, I mean, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works that it, no, so no man may boast. So there's a couple elements in that. We are actually saved by God's grace, not by merit, and we are saved through faith. But he gives us the faith, it says, that not of yourselves. So he gives us the faith. Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except the Spirit of God draw him. Okay. So we believe that we are saved once and for all because it's all the, our salvation is all the activity of God. Uh, God loved us and sent his Son. The Son took our place on the cross. The Son sent the Spirit. The Father and the Son sent the Spirit to dwell within us as a seal, you know, 
keeping us and that he's not going to lose us. Jesus said in John chapter 10, the father who's greater than all holds you in his hand and no one can snatch you out of his hand. So there's a lot of supporting evidence to why we believe that. But the truth is, it's true. Now, people who say it's not true have a crisis on their hands. Because if you say that you're not always saved once you are saved, that means you're falling into the category of what Hebrews 6 is talking about. You make Christ die twice. In other words, if Christ died once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, uh, 1 Peter 5, 18. If that's true, then if you're going to crucify him again because you lost your salvation and he's got to come again and die for you, he's not going to do that. He can't do that. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Okay, now if you have questions at home about how to get your catechism started or you know, anything like related to this, please feel free to give us a call at the church, 972-544-3564. Or you can email me, P.B. Mashburn, as in Pastor Bob Mashburn, at gmail.com. Ask your question, and I promise you that I'll write you back and give you an answer. It's important to me as a pastor to realize that one of the things I'm trying to do is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And what better way to do that than to teach you how to write your own catechism so that day by day, you know, you're following biblical instruction leading to your own discipleship, your own personal holiness, and maybe having the opportunity to have a broad opportunity to witness to other people. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For this lesson tonight, Lord, use it, I pray, in our lives that we might be serious, Father. I know there's a trap, Father, that we can fall into. We can, we can treat this like some sort of mantra like those Eastern religions do. That's, that's not right. Or we can fall too heavy upon it and not make it a part of us, but we use it just like something that we say over and over and over again, like some people use the Lord's Prayer. Help us to not do that, Father, but to use our catechism as a living and dynamic way, Father, to, uh, to be brought closer to you. Always guided and reminded, Father, that the first and great commandment is that we are to love you with all our heart, our soul, our strength, with all that is within us, Father, because you are worthy of this. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.